invite you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We are working our way into this very important, crucial section, actually, in John 5, where Jesus is claiming to be God. And this is one of those sections that he is making a shocking claim, certainly shocking to those people who are near him, around him, of how um, Jesus is God the Son. He begins to explain that and, and say that. And now we're in verses 25 through 29. And we have this recorded, Jesus speaking, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. If you were to argue, and sometimes you may find yourself doing this, arguing with maybe a Jehovah's Witness or somebody like that about the deity of Christ, where would you start? What would you say? How would you um, make the case that Jesus is God? It would probably follow somewhere along these lines. One, you might say, well, the names in Scripture that are applied to Christ can only be applied to God. That's certainly true. A second line of argument might be the attributes that are predicted of Christ can only be said of God works that are done by Christ that only God can do, Jesus did them. Another would be um, worship is rendered to Christ, and in fact, Jesus even commanded people to worship him. Worship was only to happen to God. Remember the very first, uh, the very first law of the Ten Commandments is what? That no other God before me. And the Jewish people would say every day, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Worship the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. All those things would make the, the case that there is one God, and yet here where Jesus is saying, I am that one God, and you worship me. Or you might go to the place where the claims that are made by Jesus for himself can only be true of God. And anyone who would challenge the deity of Jesus Christ would have to uh, give adequate answers to those challenges. Beginning in verse 17 of, Ma of uh, John chapter 5, Jesus is making some of those claims. Last week we noted that he claimed to be able to do what the Father does, namely raise the dead and judge the world. Today we pick up more of the same with emphasis on resurrection. On the surface, we would define, well, you, you know what resurrection is. We would define that as bringing that which is dead back to life. But it might be a little bit more complicated than that, or complex at least. Resurrection could be physical or it could be spiritual. Physical resurrection could be to mortal life or it could be to immortality. It's fair to say that only one so far has been physically resurrected to immortality, and that is Jesus. All other resurrections that have occurred that are recorded in the Bible were technically, you could call them resuscitations. Oh, they really died. They were brought back to mortal life, not immortal life. Every single person that was raised back from the dead that's recorded in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, every one of those people died again. So it was, a, it was mortal life, not immortality. Spiritual resurrection would be bringing to life spiritually what was spiritually dead. We could call that regeneration, or simply new life in Christ, or salvation. So when Jesus says in verse 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live, what was he talking about? 
not all agree, but I think he was first speaking of spiritual resurrection. And then, by verse 28, he begins to speak about physical resurrection. First, he speaks of the legitimacy of Jesus' claims of, to deity. It speaks of that. Second, it reminds us that physical existence does not end when we physically die. There are many people who believe that, okay, you, you live, you die, that's it. And the Bible would say no, not at all. We live, we die, we continue to exist for all eternity. There's more to come. And these truths will carry some very important applications for us. For all you kids who have an uh, activity sheet, by the way, if you have adults, when you have the, the sermon outline with you, um, normally I take out words and, and have you fill them in. And I sent that to Tom Rich to print off, and I forgot to remove the words, so you don't have anything to write, okay? Um, I looked at that this morning, and I went, whoa, I forgot. But anyway, that's all right. I gave you some things to do at the end, so we'll talk about that when we get there. But you kids, you have some words to fill in, actually a couple of words, and they're really big words today. So there may be a challenge to spell, but I think you'll be able to figure it out. Both the words begin with R. I've already used both of them, but I'll use them again several times. The first word means to bring back to life. And the second word means to bring back to life. Okay, so two big words are not the same, but you'll figure them out. I'll try to help you as we go along. Let's talk about Jesus' ministry right now in verses 25 through 27. What is his ministry right now in regard to spiritual resurrection or what I'm calling regeneration? What is this ministry? Um, Jesus basically described it when he said, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. What does he mean by that? Well, some heard Jesus during his earthly ministry. I'm using quotations around the word heard. Not long ago, we examined John chapter 4. Remember that text where there was a woman who was a Samaritan? She came to the well. Um, Jesus was there. He asked for a drink. And you remember the conversation. As that continued on, at some point, the woman believed. And then she ran back to town, to Sychar, to tell, tell the people there is one who came and he told me everything I ever, ever did. She believed in him and, and in she sharing about Jesus, some of those people believed in him. And then after that, Jesus, uh, they came, many of them came to see Jesus and talk to him. He went back with them and stayed a couple of days and many believed in Jesus. Here's the text. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. He stayed there two days and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. We know that this indeed is the savior of the world. In other words, Jesus is teaching they heard. They heard in their mind, their heart. They heard who Jesus was. They embraced that by faith. They became believers in Jesus they became alive in Christ. That's regeneration. Some, like the Apostle Paul, heard the voice of Jesus calling them to new life. For Paul, um, that was recorded for us in Acts chapter 9. Paul was changed from being an enemy of Jesus to a preacher calling people to believe in Jesus. What happened? Paul's on his way to destroy Christianity, and this time, Jesus literally speaks. And Paul hears, and he doesn't just hear words, but he hears the gospel, and he believes, and he becomes a new creation in Christ. His whole life changes, regeneration. Now, we don't hear voices from God, but we hear the word of God, and when we hear the word of God, everyone in this room who has become a believer in Jesus, you heard and you believed, and you became alive. That's what Jesus is talking about here. In him you also, said Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That's regeneration. 
we were dead in trespasses and sin, but we heard the word, the voice of the Son of God, and hearing, we were made alive in Christ. That's regeneration. Jesus was and is claiming that people who hear his voice, that is, who believe in him, will live, and those who hear will have eternal life. Probably no place in the Bible is it more crystal clear than in Ephesians chapter 2 when Paul wrote, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, don't you love those statements? But God, wow. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. That's regeneration. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Regeneration. How the ministry happens, how can he do that? How can Jesus make people alive spiritually? How can he take dead people, dead men walking, who are separated from God, lost in their transgressions, how can he give them life? How is that possible? Well, according here, what Jesus is claiming is that he has in himself life. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. In other words, he is self-existent, self, uh, life is in him. Our lives are, are dependent uh, on many things and derived from many things. We have parents. We were conceived. We did not have a previous existence. Please, please, please don't buy the lie that a long time ago you had another life no you didn't you didn't exist and then your parents conceived you and you were born and that's the beginning of your existence when you were conceived you had a beginning but you will not have an end you live forever and I use the word lived carefully I'll explain it in a bit to sustain life, we need favorable environment, including air, water, food, shelter. Ultimately, our very existence depends on God, who is the author and sustainer of life. But God requires nothing for himself in order to live. And absolutely nothing brought about his existence. He has life in himself. He is self-existent. The same is true of the Son of God. Jesus would later tell his disciples in the other room, uh, upper other room, in the upper room, um, I am the way, the truth, and the what? Life. He, as life itself, can grant to others life, and that's what he claims. And so we need to address why the ministry of regeneration happens. How does it happen? Jesus, who has life in himself, has the authority to execute that in the lives of people. And so, Jesus says in the passage, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. As the Son of God, he has the authority from God the Father to grant life to whom he will, verse 21. That's the prerogative of God, and Jesus is equal to the Father. That's the prerogative of Jesus as the Son of God to give life to whom he will. And then, as the Son of Man, he has the authority as man to grant life and to judge life in man. He does not need to appeal to a higher authority. He decides as man, albeit a perfect man, for man, and he decides as God in regard to man's eternal destiny. Say it another way, Jesus is the God-man. He has the authority to grant life to dead sinners by making them alive when they were previously dead in their sin. He regenerates them. He quickens them. He makes them alive in him. And as we heard God's word, God is speaking. When the, spiritually, when, when the spiritually dead, those who are lost without Christ, hear the voice of, of the Son of God 
through the words of the Bible and the work of the Holy Spirit, God regenerates the dead and makes them alive in Christ. We call it conversion. We call it salvation. We call it being saved. We call it trusting in Jesus. That's what Jesus is talking about. That has to happen to us for us to be spiritually alive, and only the Son of God can do that. Remember when Jesus, well, I think it was one of the apostles in, in Acts chapter 4, remember when he said, there is salvation in what? No other name except Jesus. Only he can grant eternal life. And so he's teaching these people who are listening, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. He's talking about regeneration. All right, the second thing he starts talking about in verse 28 through the, uh, those next two verses, uh, Jesus' ministry later on. So first we're talking about people who are dead in their sin, they need to be regenerated, they need to be brought, made alive, they need to come alive in Jesus, and so he speaks and they do. Now he talks about physical resurrection. Verse 28, don't marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Jesus makes the case here that the ministry of resurrection involves everybody. An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. In a while, it'll probably be a few months from now, but we'll get to John chapter 11. When we get to that passage, that's, that's a funeral service. You remember this, the account? It's when Lazarus died. He was a good friend of Jesus. Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, Lazarus died. You know the story. He's four days in the tomb. Jews did not embalm. So as soon as a person passed away, they were immediately entombed. Such was the case for Lazarus. So Jesus comes late to the funeral. And after talking to some of the people for a while, particularly Mary and Martha, then he says to the family, roll the stone away. I think it was Martha who said, not a good idea. And she commented about the anticipated stench. Nevertheless, this, the, at Jesus' request, the stone was rolled away, and then with a loud voice, Jesus calls out the name Lazarus. And this dead guy, formerly dead guy, walks out of the tomb. That's a vivid picture of what's going to happen some, someday to everyone in regard to resurrection. Someday, Jesus will speak, and all who have died will be raised. Bodies. Regardless of when they died, regardless of how they died, all will be raised. All of those bodies will be brought back to life. All of them, and Jesus even says, do not marvel at this. I kind of do. That's amazing. Some in this crazed world we live in uh, maybe think zombies. This isn't that, okay? This, this is real people, bodies raised. They're walking around. They're whole. They're complete. More than 500 years earlier, the prophet Daniel received these words. Those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. It's a Hebrew word word for resurrection. Those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Daniel is saying that all will be raised, but not all will have the same experience. Illustrations of this event periodically have appeared in history, but all of those who are raised to life died again. Only Jesus was raised from death to life, never to die again, but others will follow. That's future promised by Jesus Christ. Now, on the one hand, everyone will be raised from the dead, but it would not be precise to say that all will be made alive. Let me explain. All who died will be raised, and all will stand before God 
in this resurrected flesh. That will include those who believed in God and in his salvation and those who did not believe in him. Those who believed will, body and spirit, enter the presence of God and forever enjoy the wonders of all God has prepared for those who love him. Those who do not believe during their earthly lives, those who do not believe during their earthly lives will stand in, the resurre in resurrected flesh before the judge who will declare that he never knew them, and they will be cast out of his presence to experience forever an existence without the mercy of God. Both groups will be raised, in Daniel's words, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Here are Jesus' words, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. What did Jesus mean by that? Let's talk about the ministry of judgment for all. In one sense, all are judged on the basis of what they do, but we need to be careful how we understand those words of Jesus. We know that God has made it clear that none of us are good, right? I mean, very clear. There is none that seek after God. There is none that are good. Only God is good. All have sinned, all come short of the glory of God. And so, read Romans 1, 2, and 3, and you cannot come away with any other conclusion. So in that sense, no one has done good. Paul would pound the pulpit, and, and we've embraced that, I think. We are saved by what? Grace, through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. I think we have that. I think we get it. So in that case, then, why did Jesus say, and maybe it's a little troubling to you, why did he say those who have done good to the resurrected, resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment? We get the last statement, but we wonder about the first. Let me see if we can figure this out. In the next chapter, actually, Jesus will tell the people when they ask, what must, we do, what must we do to be doing the works of God? You know what his answer was? This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. I think that in part is what Jesus is talking about. The good done was ultimately done by Jesus, and those who have believed in him are credited with his righteousness. We're already judged for our sins, so in him we are found not guilty. Also consistent in the Bible, though, is the teaching that changed lives produce good deeds. Um, how many times have you said this? Well, you'll know them by their fruit. So in other words, people who have been changed by God, when you look at them, their outward expression of their faith is, is seen as good. I mean, we, we do good things because we've been changed, our hearts have been regenerated, so that now we belong to Jesus, we begin to demonstrate the character of Jesus in our daily life. If the claim of regeneration is made and no good works are evident, there's a problem. Jesus is not saying that our good works are somehow rewarded with favorable judgment but that the good works are the evidence of a regenerated life. Judgments are made often on the basis of evidence. If it was a court of law and someone is going to be judged either innocent or guilty, it's based on evidence. The evidence of our lives provide in some sense that, though God already knows our heart, but you get the idea. I think that's what Jesus was talking about. For all others, the news is not good. In Jesus' words, it is not a resurrection of life, but a resurrection of judgment. In other words, all who are raised who have not believed in Jesus will stand before him and acknowledge that they did not receive him as the Lord, and then they'll be forced to acknowledge the, his lordship and then cast from his presence. That is a horrible picture. 
Any of you who have spent any time reading the Bible and the New Testament have come across passages that are shocking when people who go through their whole life doing whatever they want, thinking everything's fine, and then they come to the end of their life and they've rejected Jesus all during their lifetime, they will have to acknowledge that he, in fact, was the life, was the truth. He was the way, but we turned away from that, and so we will have to say, you're right, you were Lord, you were God, all those things are true in the word, and then you will be cast away from his presence. That's a terrible picture. But that's the picture of scripture. All those who are outside of Jesus will face that kind of eternity. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed. You know the Philippians 2 passage. At the name of Jesus, what? Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Ultimately confessing that Jesus is Lord, but that doesn't mean that once people confess Jesus as Lord after they've died, standing before God, they will be saved. No. Those who did not love Jesus during their life will be separated from Jesus for eternity. Jesus would say it this way, Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the, the king will say to those on the right, Come, come. You who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you and from the foundation of the world. And then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Jesus is saying two things are going on here. One, that only... Only when we are quickened, only when we are regenerated, will we have life in Jesus. He speaks, we hear, we embrace by faith, we have new life in him, we're regenerated. All who know Christ, all who have been quickened in their heart to believe the gospel, all who belong to Jesus, we will someday, our bodies will be raised, our spirit, which is already, if, we're, if we've died, or if it's already in heaven, will be joined with our body, and we will be absolutely complete and whole. Our redemption will be complete at that point, and we will forever rejoice in a glorified body, in a spirit that has been changed and quickened by God, in his presence forever, and enjoy the blessings and wonder and glory of God for eternity. But if we have rejected Jesus, then our spirit goes to a place of torment, and then someday when Jesus returns, later than that actually, our bodies will be raised, that is those who are unbelievers, their body and their spirit will be joined they will be forced to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, and then they will go to a place of separation from God, from his mercy and grace forever. To be tormented in that resurrected flesh and spirit that's separated from God. Not what you really want to hear, but the truth of Scripture. And Jesus is saying that he is the one that can give life, and he's the one that raises the dead. Now tell me he didn't claim to be God. He has that authority to do so, and he does. So there you have it, regeneration and resurrection. Those two truths are very, very important for us to grasp. In light of what we've studied, I have a few assignments that I would like to suggest 
that you consider for yourself and your family. If our life is sending mixed messages, mixed signals about our status as regenerated people, in other words, if it's difficult for others to identify me or members of my family as true believers, there is a problem. And we need to be the kind of people who not only claim a relationship with Jesus, but live it out daily. If people would talk about me, say, well, I don't know what he believes, but he sure lives like he doesn't believe in God, that's a horrible testimony. If God has regenerated us, then it should follow that we look like what the Savior wants us to look like. If we don't, maybe we better check our heart. And if we really do belong to Jesus, perhaps it's time to put away some stuff and to put on some other things. Secondly, are there some adjustments that I or we need to make to bring our behavior in line with our claim of regeneration? Third, for the next few days, why don't we begin each morning with just thanking our God for having regenerated us to new life, praise him that he has saved us, and thank him that he keeps us? Now, some of you, that's like saying, well, doesn't everybody do that? <laughs> and for some of you, I never thought of that. You know the little song, uh, little chorus that was sung probably back in the 60s, once in a while you hear it? Um, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and free. If I get up every morning singing that, I'd be off to a good start. That's not always the, the song I sing. Sometimes it's nobody knows the troubles I've seen. <laughs> You know what? My perspective is off. Because look what he's done. He's saved my soul. He's made me whole. He's going to someday raise this body and he's going to bring me with him to rejoice with him forever. And I'll never have any of this other problem. This stuff is just saying, you know what? This is a reminder that there's something better. There's something better. There's something better. I'm going to be with Jesus someday and all this is going to be behind. But there are a whole lot of people who don't know that. I got a mission. I got to tell people about this because someday the king is coming. Someday the judge is coming someday we got to be ready so tomorrow morning when you wake up thank you Lord for saving my soul and then consider speaking or emailing or texting or writing a letter whatever that is um, to somebody who has not yet quote unquote heard the voice of the son of God and share your testimony with them We sometimes don't know how to share, and maybe we're afraid to speak. Maybe we're shy by nature. Uh, write it down. Type it out on your phone, whatever. There, there was a, um, one of the guys that used to be a deacon um, years ago. We, we would meet almost every Monday for uh, 45 minutes or an hour. We'd share together. I remember him saying, he goes, I work with this guy all the time, and, and I just... He goes, I, I want to talk to him about the Lord, but it just seems like there's never an opportunity. And, and, the, and so we talked about that, and then he came back a few weeks later, and he said, you know, I scheduled a meeting with this guy, and we went out for coffee. And he, he said, I just said to him, you know, I've been wanting to tell you this for a long time, but let me just tell you about my, what I believe, what I, what I am, what drives me, what, what motivates me, what I'm anticipating, what my future is. Let me just tell you about the one I serve. Let me tell you about Jesus. I don't know if it made any impact on the guy that he talked to, but he communicated the gospel. It wasn't that hard to do. However, let's begin to do that. We need to make the gospel known. Remember that regardless of your physical condition, if you are regenerated, you will be with Christ when you die. In due time, your body will be raised and everything will be perfect. Right now in this church, um, 
the, the list of people that with infirmities is unbelievable. Um, cancers and all kinds of problems, issues after issue after issue, many, many physical challenges that people are facing. It's a reminder that we live in a house, a tent that's not designed to be permanent. But one of these days, God will raise us up. In the meantime, let's try not to dwell on that so much, but to dwell on the fact that this body may be wasting away, but I'm being renewed day by day. I mean, one final illustration, we'll wrap up. As most of you know, Lethal McDaniel lived to be 89 years old. He passed away about a week ago. Friday was the funeral. His body was entombed at Mount Olivet Cemetery. Long time before that, he was regenerated. Now, in spirit, he's with Jesus in heaven. Someday soon, that old body that was put in a tomb, Jesus is going to call out, not Lazarus, but lethal. And that body is going to come out, join with his spirit, and redemption will be complete. It's good now. I don't even know how it can be better, but apparently it is when all that's done. And that's true for everyone who knows Jesus. That's part of the hope that we have. And so we can rejoice even in suffering, rejoice in sorrow, rejoice in trouble, rejoice in persecution, rejoice in all that. Why? Because we have a Savior who loves us, who's paid for our sin, who, who, with whom we belong, and who is coming back someday to take us to be with him, and we will be there forever. Oh, change our perspective, Lord. So Jesus says, truly I say to you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear the voice and come out and those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of life. He's God, and he will do what he says, and we need to trust him. Father, thank you for allowing us time to be together. Thank you for the sweetness of worship together in communion. Thank you for the wonder and amazement that we have in your word regarding your power, your glory, the fact that we can be saved from our sin, that we can be raised from the dead, we can be regenerated and resurrected. Those are great truths. Thank you for all those things. Thank you that we can live for Jesus today. We can make Jesus known today. We can be people who demonstrate what a changed life looks like when the Savior gets a hold of us. And we can make it clear that all who believe in the Son have life, but all who do not believe in the Son have no life, but the wrath of God continues. Break our hearts. Make us thankful, rejoicing in you, sorrowful over those who are lost. And may we communicate the love of Jesus wherever we go. Thank you for the privilege of being together in Jesus' name.